so far uh, when we've been doing clustering we've been looking at a lot of k-means um, in this uh, video i'm going to look at three limitations of k-means um, the first one we're going to be able to uh, solve by doing some scaling which is a pre-processing step uh, but two of these problems we're actually going to have to use a different algorithm um, two other algorithms that are very popular uh, for clustering are db scan uh, really an important one that I wish we had time to cover, but I'm not going to talk about it. You can read up on it on your own if you like. And then agglomerative clustering is one that I'm going to do some examples with today. So the first problem has to do with uh, feature scaling. And the solution is going to be doing some pre-processing. And, and so what I've done here is I've generated some data. And I've fit two clusters to it like so. And maybe what you can tell is that in this data there's actually uh, four uh, distinct clusters uh, but we're trying to just find two of the most important clusters here and um, and so what are the things that we're measuring well I'm measuring uh, maybe the weight of something maybe these are animals of some sort and then how tall they are in centimeters okay and so I found those two clusters using regular k-means right um, now in addition to centimeters I have um, the same measure in another column in terms of meters, right? So I can see that my meters column is just one hundredth of whatever is in my centimeters column, and uh, so I'm going to do the same um, clustering on that. Uh, instead of using a centimeters column, I'm going to use a meters column. <coughs> and what you see is that I'm actually ending up with different clusters, and this should be uh, raising kind of uh, red flags for you, right? Because the data is the same; I just have different units. Uh, but k-means is finding something different, and it really shouldn't. Um, so what's going on here? Uh, depending on the units, I'm going to get different scales on the x and y axis. So here in the first one, the x goes to 10, and the y is a little bit spread out. It goes to 30. And what it's trying to do when we're doing k-means is trying to have all the points uh, be close to a cluster center. And to do that, it's helpful to have those points be far from each other. So when I have a unit like centimeter here, then it's realizing, oh, I get a big number along that y-axis. And so it's useful to kind of put those centroids as far away from each other as possible on that axis. Uh, but then when I come down here and I'm using meters instead, then uh, the, it's more spread out along the x-axis and it's doing it there. So how do we solve that um, to kind of deal with these comparisons that are really apples and oranges? I mean, how do I compare pounds to meters? Um, what we'll do is we'll apply some sort of standard scaling. And uh, that looks something like this. Um, I have my data here. Um, what, what happened here? I guess I need to rerun this. I thought I'd already done that. Uh, I actually get the plot. Um, what we'll do is we'll apply some standard scaling. And, and what standard scaling means is that we subtract the mean off each column. And so now you see we're getting negative numbers and we divide by the standard deviation of each column. And you see now we're kind of getting this data that uh, it, it's centered around zero, right, on both dimensions, and it goes about to one and negative one along both of them, right? But I can see that there's more genuine spread along the x-axis than the y-axis. And um, so we can do this automatically, this operation here, using the standard scaling preprocessor. And so what I'm gonna do down here is this, I'm going to, but let me delete this. I'm going to set up a pipeline like we've done before. <clears throat> and um, the first step, I'm going to do standard scaling. <clears throat> and in that second step, I'm actually going to go, do, go ahead and do the k-means. And I want to have two clusters as before. And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say p.fit. Uh, transform and um, I'm going to do my fit transform and I am going to feed in my data frame and at this point it doesn't really matter for my x columns whether I'm using doesn't matter whether I'm using uh, meters uh, or centimeters right because this standard scaling is it means I'm going to be getting the same thing and so I'm going to feed these in like so and um, and what is this returning? This is returning uh, the centers for each of those. So actually what I could do is I could do a fit predict. And, um, and for this, it's actually predicting what class each of these are in. 
And right, so this is what uh, what uh, class, or maybe a better word, so I'm not using a Python word, um, would be a category, something like that. And um, and so now what I can do is I can actually plot this data. And um, and if I try to do something like this, right, if I try to plot my original one, maybe I'll just grab this up here. This is going to be no good, right? Because um, when I want to, oh, and I need to get rid of that. I need to do centimeters, right? Um, when I want to plot those centroids on there, right, the centroids are from this transformed data, right? So that's no good, right? If I try to head back here and, um, and then do this piece, let me just throw this in, right? If I want to plant, uh, do that, then what? Oh, let me, let me just put this back here now, right? It doesn't make sense where they are. Right, because it's on a different scale. And so what I'm gonna have to do, right, if I want to plot these centroids, um actually just a minute, sorry, this is the wrong uh KM. I need to pull it out of uh, my pipeline. Uh what I need to do is make sure that the data I'm plotting is transformed. Right? So there's my there are my centroids. And and what I'm gonna do is this. I'm gonna um pull out the standard scalar from the pipeline like this. I say P standard, and then I'm gonna use that to transform my original data. Right, so I'm gonna transform my original data, which is data frame and then X columns, right? So that's what I have. And this is what I wanna do the scatter plot on. I wanna do this one instead of that original one. And, um, and once I do this transformation, right, that's just gonna give me, well, this isn't gonna quite work when I run that. Uh, my problem is, is that this is not a data frame yet. So I'm just gonna say data frame two equals a new data frame like that. That would almost work. I'm just gonna split this up a little bit here. I transform that. And then to keep these the same, I just need to pass along those columns as before. So I'm gonna say this equals those X columns. And so I'm gonna do that. And, and of course, these are not the actual measurements for pounds and centimeters, right? Because I've done the transformation on it. Um, but, but now what we can see is we're actually getting good uh, clusters, right? Things are more cohesive um, horizontally like this than they are vertically. Vertically, there's a very clean divide. So it makes sense that uh, we're kind of putting these in the appropriate uh, place, even though there's not a direct comparison we can make between centimeters and pounds. Okay, that was the first problem with k-means, right? Scaling and the way we fix that with k-means is we just make sure that we're doing some sort of standard scaling beforehand. Unless, of course, um, we actually know that well, both dimensions are um, in the same units and then maybe it doesn't make sense to do scaling. Okay, another issue we're gonna run into is that sometimes we're gonna have arbitrary cluster shapes. And so kind of a traditional tricky problem is while well, we're uh, making this moon-shaped data and that's going to be hard to classify because um, when we're doing k-means, we have these centroids that kind of have these nice nice neat centers. And so let me run that. And um, and so what I wanna do up here is if I head up here, remember how we did this fit predict thing before? I'm gonna do this again, fit predict. And, um, and this time I'm just gonna feed in my data frame because I only have two columns this time. And so I'm gonna do that. And let's look at, I should really make this plural. Let me look at these categories. And, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the same plot uh, or scatter just like I did before. But I'm going to pass in the color. And the color are going to be the categories that we got from the k-means. And, and you know what? I'm sorry, I'm being a little sloppy here. Uh, I don't want to have my regular pipeline anymore. I want to go back to just having a k-means by itself. I'm not going to do any standard scaling here. And km is just going to be a regular k-means with two clusters. <clears throat> And um, it's on this uh, black and white right now, which is not showing up great. So I'm gonna say color map is gonna be, um, I like tab, tab 10, it just kinda gives me 10 arbitrary colors. And um, since it's giving me 10 colors, I like to say V min equals zero and V, uh, v max equals nine to kind of spread it across those 10, 10 colors. And now I'm actually getting um, uh, well a reasonable picture, but a picture that also shows that K means is not great for this, right? It's trying to have these centers and those centers have a bunch of related data in them. 
right? So k-means is not great for this. Um, we're going to do the agglomerative testing in the next video to actually solve this problem. The other problem that uh, k-means doesn't do great with is hierarchical patterns, right? If I look at an example of a data like here, I'm like, sure, well, I could look at it and say, well, there's two big clusters, uh, but one of those clusters has kind of too many clusters in it and the other has three many clusters in it. And it'd be nice if I could get both of that information, both those levels of information uh, by running the algorithm once, right? I want to know at the top level, there's two clusters and then they each have some subclusters within them. K-means doesn't do that. All clusters are equal um, in, in K-means. Okay, so I'm gonna head over to the slides and introduce uh, agglomerative uh, clustering, which is gonna solve both of these uh, problems I just showed, well, the second two. And the strategy is that we're gonna start with a bunch of points and you know one at a time we're gonna start grouping them together. And so we're gonna look at whatever two points are nearest and we're gonna say, okay, you two are now part of a cluster. And, uh, and we keep repeating that. And, and maybe the second and third time I may say, well, these guys are also part of a cluster. Um, at, at some point, right, uh, I might have to uh, combine together an existing cluster with a kind of single point. So we can do that too. We're gonna have to measure the distance between a point and a cluster. And, and eventually we're gonna even be combining clusters uh, together, right? If, if I do this, eventually I kind of get, you know, a few remaining clusters, which is maybe the output of my algorithm. Now, there's a lot of things to configure here. Uh, for example, what does it mean for, for different points to be near each other? Um, points, we can maybe just compute like the Euclidean distance or something like that. It's, it's trickier when we have two different clusters and we're trying to see how close they are to each other. And there's different ways to define this nearest. And the configuration option for that is called linkage. Let me give you a good example. Um, I have two clusters at the top and two on the bottom. And I'm wondering which of those two are nearer each other. There's not one obvious answer. Um, if we set up linkage when I'm doing my clustering to be single, then we just look at the two points that are closest to each other. And obviously the first pair of clusters are closer to each other than the second pair. So those are the two I would merge. Um, however, if we want nice, neat, cohesive structures, um, what you might not want to, want to do is instead of looking at these two closest ones, you might look at the two that are farthest away. And if I do that, well, then I see it actually makes more sense to combine the two bottom clusters uh, than the two top clusters. And, there, and there's trade-offs. I'm maybe kind of demoing more um, about these different options. Um, so there's actually four different options that we can use when we're doing agglomerative testing. Um, I've shown the single and complete because they're the easiest to visualize. Um, the other ones are based on kind of averages of points. For example, you can take the average uh, position of every point in a cluster, um, or maybe do something about uh, variance, which is actually the default. Okay, the other configuration option is as we're kind of building these up, combining smaller clusters into bigger clusters, um, when should we stop? And, and there's two different ways we could configure this. We could configure, hey, I want exactly five clusters or 10 clusters or any N clusters, or we can set some sort of threshold, which will give us different amounts. Um, so for example, I could say, I want three clusters and just try to keep combining them. And when there are only three left, it'll just stop, right? So I could do that. Um, the other option is I could say, I want to keep combining things as long as uh, the distance be, uh, between them is less than some threshold, right? If I did that, I can see, okay, well, these two clusters have a distance of 14, uh, which is above my threshold of 10. So I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to combine these two clusters into a bigger cluster. Um, what's actually pretty common is we'll use this distance threshold and we'll set it at zero, right? There's cases where it's useful to have everything be in one big cluster that keeps getting split into two smaller clusters. Okay, so take a break from this and we'll come back and do a little um, uh, practice with SKLearn.